Okay, um, thank you very much. So, I should say straight away that the stratosphere is not my area of expertise. And so I'd like to thank a uh, colleague of mine at Reading, Andrew Charlton Perez, who, um, who gave me some of his lecture notes from one of the courses he teaches as a kind of place to start to build a lecture. So thank you to him for that. So I'm going to try and cover some aspects of stratospheric variability and prediction that might be relevant on subseasonal timescales. Um, and we'll see how we go as we go along. So I'll, in this talk, I will try and just give a brief outline of the structure of the stratosphere for those of you that don't, haven't come across stratospheric dynamics and things before. And then I'll talk a little bit about the variability of the stratosphere itself and then how that might be related to the tropospheric variability that we might be interested in predicting on subseasonal timescales. And then I'll talk a little bit about um, the actual prediction aspects for the stratosphere and the relationship between the stratosphere and troposphere. Um, so the, the stratosphere is the, the bit of the atmosphere directly above the troposphere. It's separated from the troposphere by the tropopause. And so on this, um, these um, plots here, the tropopause is marked by this dashed line. And in the tropopause, the temperature decreases with height as you go up and then at, in the, at the tropopause, the temperature is, or above the tropopause, the temperature remains constant or maybe even slightly increases with height as you go up. So this is the zonal mean temperature as a function of latitude. Um, and so you can see that in the tropics, the tropopause is around sort of 15 kilometers high. Um, and in the polar regions, it gets down to about 8 or 9 kilometers. And actually, in in synoptic weather systems, it can even get as low as four or five kilometers in the atmosphere. Um, so I've got the, the winter, the northern hemisphere winter and northern hemisphere summer season here. And you can see that the, the winter pole is, the, um, is much colder than the summer pole. And that's because basically the, the stratosphere is in radiated balance, pretty much. And so in the... Summer, part, summer pole, there's lots of heating from the sun, um, and that's balanced by radiated cooling. But in the winter pole, the, it's just cooling to space, basically, and there's no, there's no heating coming in. Um, you also notice that in the summer hemisphere, um, the temperature is actually warmer at the pole than it is at the equator as you go um, above sort of about 15 kilometers, and so that means that the, the temperature gradient is reversed in the stratosphere um, compared to the, to the troposphere. And you'll also notice that in the, in the southern hemisphere winter, the southern hemisphere stratosphere is much, much colder um, than the winter hemisphere stratosphere. Um, and that's, that's related to uh, the strength of the polar winter vortex at, at that time, which I will come to in a minute. Um, and so the, the top of the stratosphere, as it were, is, a, is sort of around 40, 50 kilometers, which is about here, it's just above here probably, and that's where the stratopause is, and then we go into the mesosphere above that, and in the mesosphere the temperatures start to decrease with height again. And I won't talk about the mesosphere anymore. Um, so, consistent with these temperature gradients that we see in the stratosphere, um, the, the zonal winds in the stratosphere are in thermal wind balance with, with those temperature gradients. And so we see in the, in the winter hemisphere, a strong westerly jet increasing with height which is consistent with warm temperatures at the equator and cold temperatures at the pole. And in the summer hemisphere, we have a, a weak easterly jet increasing with height, which is consistent with the fact that the pole is warmer than the equator. So this is, these zonal winds in the stratosphere are in, in thermal wind balance. Um, I, the stratospheric jet is slightly poleward of the, um, the subtropical jet, um, but clearly connected to the, or the, to the tropospheric jet. Um, and then 
what else have we said here? So, again, consistent with the colder temperatures in the southern hemisphere, the winter pole is... Um, the, su the southern hemisphere winter jet is much, much stronger than the northern hemisphere winter jet. Have we got anything? Right. Okay, so the other thing we haven't said about here is that the, the jet essentially describes the edge of the polar vortex. So you can, if you, if you think about the vorticity associated with the, the horizontal gradients of the wind here, then this, is, um, this jet describes the edge of the polar vortex. Are we following so far? Okay. So, you know, this just describes the mean state of the, the stratosphere in the winds. What does the variability in stratospheric wind look like? Um, so, th there are two sort of areas where there's large variability in this zonal wind structure. So, one is in the equatorial lower and mid stratosphere. Um, where you have quite large wind variability. And then the other is the variability that's associated with that winter polar jet. Um, there's very little variability in the summer hemisphere. and um, uh, I'll explain why that is in a little while. Um, but you'll notice that although there's much stronger jet in the southern hemisphere, but when you get towards the polar region, the variability of that jet is much weaker than it is in the northern hemisphere. So, in the, in the extratropical regions, this variability is largely caused by planetary waves propagating from the troposphere up into the stratosphere. And the propagation of those planetary waves and their influence on the jet is sort of determined by two things. One is the wind structure in the stratosphere, and I'll explain that a little bit later. Um, the other is the fact that, the, you know, the source of wave activity. And in the northern hemisphere, in the sort of polar regions, or the sort of higher mid-latitudes, there are lots of um, large mountains and land-sea contrast, which drives quasi-stationary planetary waves in the atmosphere. Um, well, the southern hemisphere, around 60 degrees north, or south even, um, there is, there's very little contrast in land sea or in orography. And so the wave activity, the stationary wave activity in the southern hemisphere is actually much weaker. And so there's very little wave forcing in the southern hemisphere jet. Um, so the reason there's little variability in the summer hemisphere is because the Rossby waves can only propagate vertically if there's westerly winds. And so, the, in the easterly winds of the sun, summer, polar, uh, summer stratosphere, the waves can't propagate vertically, and if they're not propagating vertically, um, they're not then transferring momentum into the, to the jet, and so they, there's no sort of source of variability on those timescales there. Okay, so let's have a little bit, you know, a, a little look at some of these modes of variability. So, the first thing we noticed here was this strong variability in the equatorial um, stratosphere, and that's dominated by something called the quasi biennial oscillation, which is this oscillation in the equatorial stratosphere between um, westerly winds and easterly winds. And this is an incredibly regular oscillation in the atmosphere. It's probably the most regular oscillation in the atmosphere other than the annual cycle or diurnal cycle. Um, and it's called the quasi biennial oscillation because its period is around two years. It's actually slightly longer than two years on average, about 27 months. But it varies between perhaps two years and two and a half years. Um, so, what's the source of this variability? Um, so, again, this is due to waves propagating vertically in the atmosphere. This time it's at, um, gravity waves, triggered by orography and convection, and 
also a little bit of influence from the large-scale planetary waves, the Kelvin waves and the Rossby waves that you learned about from Fred Kacharsky last week, um, which propagate vertically in the atmosphere. And these waves can only propagate vertically in regions where their phase speed, i.e. their eastward propagation speed, has the opposite sign to the mean wind, or if the mean wind is small. Um, so as these waves break, where they can no longer propagate, they accelerate the mean flow in the direction of their zonal propagation. Um, and so here we have a sort of a, a westerly state in the atmosphere. And these waves, which are propagating vertically, which have a, a west, an, east, uh, an eastward phase speed, so westerly phase speed, as it were, as they propagate vertically, um, they break. And the action of them breaking tends to accelerate the wind towards their phase speed in the region in which they break. Um, and so that causes an acceleration in this region, westward acceleration in these regions. But these waves that have an easterly phase speed or westward propagation can propagate st straight through this region. And they actually start to break a little bit when you get into a region where, the sh where there's an easterly shear um, as as some of these waves start to get um, uh, start to break in this region, and so that tends to decelerate the wind slightly or accelerate it slightly into the westward direction. So what triggers the gravity wave? So, so most of it is convection, um, and so the the gravity waves. But obviously, there are some orographic gravity waves as well, which propagate vertically, which cause which are a, which are a source of that. Um, and then also there are some Kelvin, there's some influence of the Kelvin wave and Rossby waves propagating vertically. The Rossby wave is a bit more complicated because you have to sort of think about um, not just the momentum, but the kind of the influence they have on the zonal, the sort of the weak overturning circulation in the troposphere, in the stratosphere as well. But, so, so. <laughs> Roughly <laughs> equally distributed. So from convection and aerograph aerography, they're pretty much roughly equally distributed. Yeah. I mean, the equatorial waves, maybe not quite so much. Um, so this, that's the, the quasi-biennial oscillation. But if we're thinking about predictability on sub-seasonal or seasonal time scales, this ought to be a pretty easy problem. You know, persistence is going to do a reasonably good, good job of predicting the phase of the QBO on sub-seasonal or seasonal time scales because it, the time scale of the oscillation is much longer than any of those. The reason, well, other than the fact that it's one of the major modes of stratospheric variability on any time scale, um, I'll come back to it a bit later, but, but the phase of the quasi-biennial oscillation can actually influence some of the sub-seasonal variability in the stratosphere. And from that point of view, it's important. Adrian. Um, well, okay. So if we come to the actually, if we come to the next slide here, so what sets the time scale is basically the uh, the, the kind of rate of which the gravity waves are fired from the the stratosphere and the, the momentum that's associated with them in their wave interaction. So um, it, it's, it's, like it's a combination of the amplitude of the wave activity and the time scale for which it, you know, it takes for them to influence the jet. Okay, so, so so the green line on here um, is on the next slide is the same as the green line on here. So the idea is that as you so you have this green state and the waves accelerate the flow here and decelerate the flow here, and so a little while later you have this blue state where you have westerlies lower down in the atmosphere and you start to get easterlies above. And then, 
the, the waves are now, the westward prop eastward propagating waves are now not able to propagate so high, and so they break lower down in the stratosphere and accelerate the wind down here, and the easterly, east, easterlies and westerlies and westwards and eastwards are really confusing, aren't they? <laughs> and we talk about easterly and westerly winds, but eastward and westward moving waves, and they are opposite, and it's really confusing. So the westward propagating waves break lower down in the atmosphere and cause an easterly acceleration lower down in the atmosphere. And so the easterly flow moves downwards. And then the, west, the eastward propagating waves break even lower down and cause this gradual um, deceleration of acceleration of the jet here. And then this eastward would start to propagate down further and further towards the surface. Okay. Um, plum, I think. Yeah, so this mechanism for the TBO is, has been known for a very long time, and it's very remiss of me not to put some references in here for this bit. Um, but you can read about this in a standard dynamical meteorology textbook like um, Holton's. Yeah, and this figure, this figure is actually, I thought I'd, 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 I thought I'd put it in there, but this figure is actually um, sort of, uh, uh, sort of modified slightly from Holton's book. Um, but so this mechanism has been long known, um, but it. It's taken a little while, sort of a few iterations, to understand what was going on. Originally, it was thought that actually it was the Kelvin waves and Rossby waves that were the kind of the dominant source of this what propagating, you know, the, the acceleration and deceleration. But but when they start to try and do sort of a quantification of that effect, they realise that the, the, those waves in themselves are not don't have enough sort of energy to to cause this oscillation, and it must be associated with the, the much faster gravity waves that are triggered by convection and orography to, to drive this mechanism. So, in the extratropics, there's a very similar source of the variability in that it's, it's dominated by planetary waves propagating from the troposphere into the stratosphere. But in the extratropics, it's, it's Rossby waves that are that wave source. And again, Rossby waves can propagate vertically in sufficiently weak westerly winds. So this, um, if the wind is between zero and some positive westerly wind called the critical velocity, um, then the waves can propagate vertically. If the winds are easterly or too strong, then they can't propagate vertically. Um, and this critical velocity depends on wavelengths in such that shorter wavelengths have a much lower critical velocity um, and so can't propagate very high. And they tend to break lower down in the, you know, the lower stratosphere. Um, so changes in this wave activity and breaking can lead to variations in the strength of the polar vortex. And if we go back to that plot of the variability, that's why there's this sort of variability in the polar regions. Um, and these, this variability in the polar vortex is, is the dominant mode of variability on sub-seasonal timescales in the stratosphere um, and the source of variability which gives us the, the greatest uh, predictability in the stratosphere on these timescales. And so, um, now as, as I'm mentioned before, the, there's very little variability in the southern hemisphere polar vortex, and that's partly because there's, there's a, a, a low source of planetary wave activity in the southern hemisphere, and it's partly because um, the, the vortex is, is very strong there, and so you, you don't get this, um, it's, it's hard to disturb it, basically, um, properly. But, I mean, you do get variability of the jet, but what you don't see very often, in fact, only ever once in history, is these um, sudden stratospheric warmings where you get a, a very rapid transition from mean westerly flow in the stratospheric polar region 
to this easterly flow. So the polar vortex has broken down completely here. And I'll show you a little animation of that in a minute. But Steve, you mentioned a sub-seasonal time scale. Yeah. Where does that time, how, how is the time scale set in the extratropics? So, it, 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 again, it's related to the kind of the amplitude of the wave forcing from the troposphere and the, the mechanisms by which that momentum is, is transferred to the jet. So, it's... Does that have to do with the time scales in the troposphere? No, not really, no. I mean, it's just to do with the... Well, I, I guess in the sense... No, the time scale isn't really set by the time scale of the variability. The, the, the time scale is really set by the, the amplitude of the, the way... Well, the, the, the ver there's variability there going on all the time. Um, what determines whether you get... Oops, what determines whether you get um, something like this is whether you have strong enough wave amplitude to, to generate that. Of, well, of the variability you're yeah. talking about. Yeah. Well, I've, so what it requires is some variation in the, amp in the amplitude of the wave. So if you have a fixed amplitude wave, then the momentum, the, the, the momentum transfer associated with that is, is negligible. So you need to have some variation in the amplitude of the wave, but it doesn't, so the shorter time scale, essentially, that's a, a larger variation in the amplitude of the wave. And so the shorter time scale waves are more important. Shorter time scale variations in the wave amplitude are more important than long time scale, slowly varying. Um, is this, is, this is just one year. Uh, this is 2008. And I'm actually going to show you this, I think, in a second. Um, so, so this reversal of the westerly wind to easterly wind also implies a reversal of the temperature gradient in the stratosphere. So this strat the, the name sudden stratospheric warming comes from the fact that you get a very rapid increase in temperature in the polar vortex um, during that time. Um, because to reverse... The wind at that height, you need a reversal in the temperature gradient, pole to equator temperature gradient at that time. This is, this is actually averaged at 60 degrees north, at where the jet is at its strongest. Um, so in the southern hemisphere, the wave forcing is generally not strong enough to create this, um, what's known as a major warming, where you get a, a reversal of the jet at the pole. It's happened once in, in history, um, and everybody got very excited, um, but it's not happened again. So I think perhaps what I will do now, um, briefly, is go to here, and so, so this is... The, the polar vortex. Um, it's an animation from January and February 2008. Um, and it's, it's this event that I showed before. I think. So this is, um, this is potential vorticity on an isentropic surface, a constant potential, uh, constant potential temperature surface. It's about 21 kilometers above the surface of the Earth. Um, and so this is um, the very high potential vorticity air that you see in the polar stratospheric vortex. And then you can think of this as being very cold air. Um, this is the low potential vorticity air of the, you know, the equatorial and tropical stratosphere. And you can think of this as being the very warm air. And this black line here essentially marks the, um, the maximum zonal wind um, associated with the polar vortex. Jet. And if we run this forward, what you'll see is that, um, so you've got this vortex, it's fairly stable, there's some movement around the polar vortex, and then as we go forward in time, you'll start, start to see that that polar vortex is getting pushed off the pole, and you've now got 
um, easterly winds at the pole. There, so there we go. So easterly winds at the pole, warm, very warm, essentially subtropical air over the pole. And um, at, this, at the end of the animation here, basically that polar vortex has been completely wiped out. So shall I run that again? Um, Mom, <laughs> let's not run it again. <laughs> oh, maybe that will work. Let's not play it again. But you can see there's a, a very remarkable turnaround of the. Um, and so that event was what's known as a displacement event because the polar vortex has just been shifted off the pole initially. Okay, hopefully, the fact that that animation won't, wouldn't run is not, um, not an indication that this one won't do as well. So this is a slightly different type of event. This is what's called a split vortex event. And what you'll see, you know, we've got this polar vortex set up at the start. And as we run through the animation, what you'll find is that you know, there's a wave event which essentially splits the vortex in two. And you'll get, there are two little vortices, or littler vortices, um, that, that sit either side of the pole. And so this is an event um, from the subsequent winter in 2008. So you can see, you can see straight away that this, the vortex is starting to be disturbed and pinched in the centre. It, it seems to re-intensify and then it splits and you have these two vortices um, and again this warming at the polar region. Can we see if that one will run again? No. Nah. Never mind. Yep. No, so that's potential vorticity, but you can think of it as being... Because potential vorticity and potential temperature are roughly conserved on the, in the stratosphere on sort of fairly short time scales, you can think about the, the potential vorticity and the temperature being sort of both uh, both traces of the of the flow. You can have more than one event in winter. It, they, the, a major warming like this, t they come along on average once every couple of years. Um, so, in fact, if, if we if we go back to Thomas's page. So this, this is so the, all these animations are available on a web page um, that Thomas Berner has at, at Colorado State, and you can see um, there is. I'm sh oh, sure I saw. So here, there's a December one, December and February event that have happened in the same winter, but it, it's it's relatively uncommon to see two two events in in one winter. That's right, yeah, I've broken them. <laughs> um, so let's go back to here. To hit. So th this, this was the zonal mean picture of that first event that I, I showed you. So you can see the, the um, uh, sort of in the middle of February, we had this change from westerly to easterly in the polar vortex. Now, one of, the, one of the sort of apparent characteristics of these um, sudden stratospheric warming events is this sort of evidence of some downward propagation of the event, in, in, certainly in the, in the stratosphere. And that's, again, related to, um, to the same kind of mechanism as the QBO. So these, west, these Rossby waves can only propagate in westerly flow. So if you have something that disturbs the flow at a particular level and creates easterly flow at that level, those Rossby waves then are breaking lower down in the atmosphere and that causes this slight downward propagation of these, um, these warming events. And that's kind of characteristic of uh, these. What you'll also notice is that if we look down at the surface, um, the, the tropospheric jet seems to have been disturbed at this, at this point as well. Um, and so there's, 
very, very convincing evidence that these southern stratospheric warmings have an influence on the, the tropospheric mid-latitude jet. Can you just say that again, Steve, on this bit, the, the mechanism of the downward... So it's similar to the gravity waves, essentially, that you have these vertically propagating Rossby waves that can only propagate in westerly flow. You've disturbed the... You've perturbed the jet here to create easterly flow here, um, or the w westerly flow is so weak that basically um, the waves can't propagate through it. Um, and you, um, as, a, as a result, the wave breaking occurs at a slightly lower altitude. Um, and, so, and then that brings the jet down. Yeah, but but here, yeah, it's the it's kind of the mechanisms are different. I suspect there's an F factor goes on somewhere, or something like that. It's above my pay grade now. Uh, so I, I've I've just sort of taken some snapshots from those videos that I showed you um, previously. So here here's um, the undisturbed vortex from from the the January 2008, I sh that was the start of the animation, first animation that I showed you. And you can see, um, you know, sort of a, the pole of the vortex sitting over the pole. Here's the, the displaced vortex event that I showed you. The pole has now got sort of low, um, low PV air and the, the vortex has moved off the, the pole. And then this is from this split vortex event. And so, so uh, southern stratospheric warmings sort of can be classified if you want to make classifications about them, but they're kind of a spectrum of events. But so there, there's two classifications associated with the strength of the, the warming. So there's a major warming, um, which is sort of where the zonal wind is reversed over the polar cap and these climatological waste, westerlies are replaced by easterlies. And they happen every two years, once, you know, on average, every other year or something like that. They're not every other year, but on average, they're once every two years or so. Um, and then there are minor warmings where there's a strong perturbation of that polar vortex, but not strong enough to actually cause a reversal of the winds. And they occur most years and, you know, more than once most years. And then these, you can also categorise them by their, whether there's sort of this displacement warming or a split vortex warming. Um, and these displacement warmings um, are sometimes called a wave one warming because you can, if you were to look at the, the zonal wave number around this region, it would be a wave number, wave, zonal wave number one perturbation to the jet. And these are called wave two warmings because it would be a wave number two perturbation on the on the jet, on the zonal flow. Um, but so, so these, these classifications you will, you will hear about, because to a certain extent the major warming is distinctly different from the minor warming. If you work on the stratosphere, you'll hear about these terms. And the, the impact of these two types of event on the troposphere is perhaps slightly different. But I'm not going to say any more about that. Right, so we've had the polar vortex and we've had the QBO. Um, so there is some evidence that the, the QBO influences the occurrence or the, the strength of the variability in the polar vortex. So these waves are propagating vertically into the stratosphere, um, are also propagating towards the equator. Um, and their propagation towards the equator depends on the strength of the flow. And just as they can't propagate vertically in easterly flow, they can't propagate meridionally into easterly flow either. So if you have easterly flow, the easterly phase of the QBO, um, at the equator, then those waves that propagate or can't propagate so quickly into the um, into the, stratus, into the equatorial region, and they tend to be more confined into the mid-latitudes. And so you tend to get um, more wave activity in the, the northern hemisphere winter in the easterly phase of the QBO. 
If you have the westerly phase of the QBO, then the waves can propagate away from the mid latitudes more readily, and so that tends to reduce the wave activity in the, in the mid latitudes. So, and this stronger wave activity tends to lead to more disturbed vortex during the easterly phases of the QBO. So, you can see that in a kind of time mean picture that you have these more displaced vortex events or more um, disturbed vortex events. If you look at the time mean, that rectifies onto that. And so this is the difference in temperature at 10 hectopascals between easterly phases of the QBO and westerly phases of the QBO. And so you can see that the pole is warmer on average during easterly phases of the QBO than it is on westerly phases of the QBO. So that's one re reason we might be interested in the QBO, because it potentially has an influence on the likelihood of a southern stratospheric warming, which we care about on subseasonal timescales. Um, so, for similar reasons, the influence of the phase, you know, the, 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 the phase of the QBO and its influence on wave propagation may also impact the response of the QB, uh, uh, a response of the polar stratosphere, that should say, to ENSO. Okay, so, um, if you if you look in easterly phases of the QBO, um, then ENSO has very little impact on the stratospheric polar vortex. But in westerly phases of the QBO, um, La Nina tends to be associated with a colder and stronger vortex, and El Nino with a warmer and weaker vortex. Um, and so this is a similar plot now of the difference um, in temperature between uh, for, for, for the winter between La Nina and El Nino years. And so you can see in La Nina years you have a colder polar temperature and a stronger vortex. And so that, again, is likely to have an influence on the likelihood of sudden warmings and things like that. Right. So, with lots of variability in the stratosphere, but if we're interested in predicting weather in the troposphere, why do we care? So, The, the variability in the stratosphere this, of this polar vortex can you know, be described quite well by, um, by an annular mode. So it's an oscillation of the strength of the, the jet. And those annular modes can be found sort of all the way down through the, the troposphere. Um, and in the troposphere, we call those annular modes essentially, well, so there's the northern annular mode, which is just definition of this you know, annular variation of the vortex. But in the, at the surface in the northern hemisphere, these are strongly related to um, the North Atlantic Oscillation or the Arctic Oscillation, depending on where you live and what you want to call it. Um, in the southern hemisphere, the variability of the jet is even low down. It's called, just called the southern annular mode because at the surface, the vortex or the jet is still fairly zonal, and so it, it, the, the jet varies sort of in an annular way, but because in the northern hemisphere the jet near the surface um, is broken up by the continents and the land sea and various things, the storm tracks, um, we tend not to refer to it as an annular mode in the troposphere, but we talk about the northern, um, the North Atlantic Oscillation or the Arctic Oscillation. And so what I've shown here is uh, composite events composites of 18 weak vortex events, so that would be a sudden stratospheric warming or a minor warming, um, and 30 strong vortex events. So here we can see, um, so this is, this is an index of this northern annular mode. Um, so we can see the, sort of the weak vortex event in the, tropos in the stratosphere, um, but it's associated with weak vortex or the, you know, the, the weak jet phase of the northern annular mode in the, in the troposphere. And similarly, for strong events, we can see the same sign of this northern annular mode all the way through. Um, and there's also evidence of this kind of downward propagation of this, of this signal. Although this may, you know, the downward propagation may be, may be a little bit of an artifact in the sense that it might not propagate downwards in, in a, as, a, as a wave all the way into the troposphere. It might just be that the, it propagates downwards through the stratosphere, 
um, and then you tend to get this sort of rather sort of uniform response in the troposphere. So it looks like it's propagating downwards through the troposphere because you just sort of carry the thing through, but it's more like it gets to the tropopause and then it starts to have an influence on the, tropos um, the tropospheric variability. Um, so this sort of relationship between the stratospheric variability and the tropospheric variability hints that there might be some predictability in the troposphere associated with these events. Yeah. Yeah. So there are. Yeah. So the mechanisms for this stratospheric influence on the troposphere are still not clear. Um, they, so it could be that the, the the stratospheric or you know tropopause variations influence directly the growth of the the baroclinic waves in the in the troposphere, and that has an influence on the the jet. It could just be um, you've changed the potential vorticity in the stratosphere and the troposphere feels those poten that potential vorticity essentially and just adjusts in response to those potential vorticity anomalies. Or it might be that it, it's actually sort of related to the same mechanism by which the vortex is disturbed in that you get this um, relationship between the wave propagation and the... Um, the, and the, the, the mean wind and so, so there's some complex wave mean flow interaction but there's no consensus on which of these mechanisms is dominant and it's likely that at least you know that more than one of them is playing a role in some way um, so I'll now try and sort of characterise the relationship between the polar vortex and the troposphere so what have we got here on the left these are surface pressure anomalies after weak and strong vortex events. And so you can see, so unfortunately, these are contoured rather than coloured. But after a weak vortex event, you tend to get sort of anomalously low pressure in the, over the sort of um, northern mid-latitudes around Europe and high pressure over the, over the surface and that's associated essentially with a weakening of the pressure gradient and a weakening of the jet and after strong vortex events you see uh, increase in pre pressure over the pole, a decrease in pressure over the North Atlantic and a, um, a strengthening of the North Atlantic jet. And so if you look at the, the distribution of the North Atlantic oscillation index um, following um, you know, for 60 days after a weak vortex event or 60 days after a strong vortex event, you can see a clear shift towards higher North Atlantic oscillation indices following strong vortex events than um, weak vortex events. And if you look at the surface temperature anomalies um, following stratospheric... Um, so this is weak minus strong vortex events. So you can see the, the, this you know, much colder... Uh, North American and no Northern Eurasian temperatures following weak events compared to strong events. So this is quite a large signal in the in the troposphere, and it seems to be associated with stratospheric variability. So that implies there might be some useful predictive capability associated with the stratosphere. So is that predictive capability realised? So um, Sigmund, you know, Demon explored this in uh, the Canadian, well, it's called the Canadian Middle Atmosphere Model because it has the stratosphere and mesosphere in the model, not because it's just a model of the middle atmosphere. Um, and looked at a set of hindcasts, basically initialised on the dates of 20 sudden stratospheric warmings and compared them to a set of control forecasts where he took the same day of the year um, but ran the forecast for the year before or the year after. So essentially, he's, he's, he's constructed his control that way so that he's capturing the same time in the seasonal cycle, but randomly selecting, essentially, a, a stratospheric initial condition that may or may not have a warming event in it. And so if you, if you look at the ones initialised following a sudden stratospheric warming, um, you'll notice two things. So, the, so this is a, the Northern Annular Mode Index at the surface, 
um, you see that the, the main northern annular mode index at the surface observed is, is less than zero. Um, and the mean forecast annular mode index is less than zero. So we're seeing the signal here and the forecast models in the mean are able to capture that. And you actually see that virtually all of the forecasts uh, or all of the runs fall in this quadrant here. So the observed signal and the forecast signal are in the same quadrant. If we look at the control, and there's quite a strong correlation between the observed and forecast signal. If you, if you look at the events which are initialized essentially randomly, um, you can see that the, the forecasts and the, observ and the observations are actually distributed much more through all of the quadrants. So, and the mean signal in the observations and the forecast is close to zero. So there's very little signal. Um, the forecasts, on average, have got the right response, but actually there's very little correlation between what was observed and what was forecast. So this demonstrates two things. One, it demonstrates that there's a signal associated with the sudden stratospheric warming. But the other thing it demonstrates is that um, forecasts are able to capture the response, but not only are they able to capture the response, but th there is some predictability more than there is in the normal situation associated with that. You know, so here the forecasts don't do a very good job, essentially. So it also has an impact on seasonal predictability. Um, so if we look at things like uh, surface temperature, so this is observed and forecast after a sudden stratospheric warming. So you can see warm over northern Europe, warm over the Middle East, cold over so North America, rather, warm over the Middle East um, and cold over North and Eurasia. Um, and the precipitation, you can see enhanced, um, enhanced precipitation over the North Atlantic region, sort of a dipole pattern. Um, and if you look at the, the conditional um, skill scores for surface temperature, um, so these are essentially, oh, sorry, correlation skill scores for surface temperature conditioned on whether it's following a sudden stratospheric warming or not. You can see that there's higher skill um, for these surface temperatures or the surface precipitation over the Atlantic following a sudden stratospheric warming than not. Oh, I don't need to go there to move it on. Um, and there's a similar signal on sub-seasonal timescale, so I'm aware we're going on a bit on time here. But. So, um, Om Tripathi and colleagues recently looked at the impact of sudden stress rate warmings on sub-seasonal predictability in ECMWF, monthly forecasting system. So this again is a composite based on you know, strong, medium and weak events. Um, uh, 10 hexapascals and 60 north, I think that probably says under that figure. Um, and so you can see that, the again, observed on the top and forecast on the bottom, you can see the model is able to capture reasonably well the stratospheric evolution of the vortex, um, but also the tropospheric response to the, to the vortex. Um, and if you, if you look at the surface temperature or sea level pressure and temperature signals associated with that, Again, you can see at week two, this picture of warm over North America, cold over East Asia, and warm over the Middle East is, is there in the observations at week two after these events and in the model. Um, and similarly, still the signal is there at week three in the observations, and the model is able to capture most of that response, and again, um, at week four. And so there's this signal in the stratosphere that is driving variability in the troposphere, and the forecast model seems to be able to capture that quite well. Um, but not only does it, not only is that signal predictable, but for some regions and in some places, it actually improves the predictive skill of the model. 
Um, and so we can see uh, some examples of that. So, um, so or should I should, should say what this is. So this is the temperature anomaly um, following a weak and strong event. Um, and this is observed and forecast and observed and forecast depending on the, the sign of the anomaly, basically. And you can see that the model is able to pretty well capture the, the strength of that observed signal. Um, and if you look at the, the forecast skill for the northern annular mode index in uh, weak vortex or southern stratospheric warming events and strong vortex events, you can see that the forecast skill, as measured by the anomaly correlation, is higher in disturbed vortex equation. Um, situations than it is during the undisturbed vortex conditions. So not only is it a, 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 sor a source of, um, of variability, it's also a source of predictability, enhanced predictability in these disturbed conditions. And this is a similar plot for uh, temperature in following weak or strong events. And you can see in some regions so over the Middle East at week four, much higher predictability following in surface temperature following a weak vortex event um, than under sort of normal conditions in the stratosphere. And similarly over eastern Canada. Right, I think we're near the end. Oh, no. So how predictable are these sudden stratospheric warmings? So if you've got a sudden stratospheric warming in your forecast, then that suggests you've got improved predictive capability over the northern hemisphere for the next 30 to 60 days. But if we could predict when those southern stratospheric warming events might happen, that gives us even more predictive, you know, an even longer lead time of predictive capability. So to date, there hasn't been an, an enormous amount to look at those, um, the predictability of the warmings. Most studies focus on the prediction of an individual event rather than an ensemble of events. Um, and that suggests sort of a skill of you know, at lead times of 5 to 15 days, depending on which event you look at and which model you look at. Studies that have looked at vertical or horizontal resolution have tended to show that improved vertical resolution or improved top higher top, model top, or improved horizontal resolution tend to improve forecasts, um, as does as do forecasts which have a better representation of the mean stratospheric state, which is important for being able to predict the interaction between the planetary wave and the, and the jet. Um, and if you can improve the representation of the stratosphere in your models, then that gives you... Um, a better chance of assimilating satellite observations of stratospheric temperature into your forecast, and so improve your initial conditions in the forecast, and that might give you better predictability. So one potential source of predictability for sudden stratospheric warmings is the MJO. So this paper by Garfinkel a few years ago explored the link between the Madden-Julian oscillation and sudden stratospheric warmings, and found that... So this is the MJO phase before a sudden stratospheric warming event. And so um, between 1 and 12 days ahead of a sudden stratospheric warming, you're much more likely to find an MJO in phase 7 or 8 than you are climatologically, um, and much less likely to find an MJO in phase 2 than you are climatologically. And as you go back in days then what you'll find is that this, where you're likely to find the MJO moves backwards in time, because obviously the MJO has a kind of time scale associated with it. Um, and if you look at polar cap temperatures, which is you know, like a measure of the strength of the vortex as a function of lag in this direction, following particular MJO phases along this direction, again, you can see that there's this clearly clear relationship between MJO phase and um, polar temperature. So we've got potential predictability of the vortex warming associated with, um, with the MJO, for example. So if we've got an MJO in our initial condition, that might give us more predictability for the, the polar jet or the polar vortex. Um, 
But obviously also, you know, if we can predict the MJO phase a few days in advance, then maybe that extends our predictability back slightly further in time as well. Um, it's wishful thinking by this stage, though, probably. So I'll try and summarise. So the stratosphere is, is characterised by strong static stability um, with uniform or slightly increasing temperature with height. Um, there's strong seasonality in the zonal winds and temperature which are in thermal wind balance with a, a westerly polar vortex in the winter hemisphere and easterlies in the summer hemisphere. Equatorial variability is dominated by the, the QBO, which is driven by this interaction between vertically propagating gravity waves and the mean flow. Um, there's weak variability in the summer hemisphere and the winter polar vortex variability is driven by an interaction between vertically propagating Rossby waves and the mean zonal wind. Um, for strong wave forcing, that winter polar vortex can break down and you have sudden stratospheric warmings. Um, and there's a, a strong teleconnection between the stratosphere and troposphere associated with these annular modes, um, which leads to potential predictability on sub-seasonal to seasonal time scales. Operational prediction systems are able to capture some of this tropospheric response to polar vortex variability. Um, and so strong and weak vortex conditions can not only improve, um, you know, give you a signal to predict, but they actually enhance your predictability on those timescales. And there is potential to predict that these sudden stratospheric warming events at lead times of a week or two as well, which might um, further enhance our predictability. Thank you. Thank you.